Where are we on? Do I like asking if we're on every time I come on? <laughs> Oh, I can hear me. I guess it's a good sign. I'm going to working. <sighs> Guess not. Wait, where am I echoing? I don't know why it might be because I have myself open on two different windows. Yeah, that'll be it. I was only echoing to myself. But as my title suggests, we are going back into the wonderful 221B Baker Street. And we will check on our dear friends, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Keep having to figure out what's going on with the sun. I don't know why sound alerts is refusing to work properly. But it's been regularly acting up on me, so I guess it's nothing new. I've even added a few more sounds. Let's see. Listen. No chat delay. Save. Last time I was doing the set to go to their website and essentially clear their cache so I could get things to work right on my channel, but I'm not sure what's going on with it though. Refresh browser source. Let's see, I don't think you don't see my chat yet, so we'll check it again. Still isn't working right. I just can't figure out what the hell is going wrong with it. I don't have a queue of them. And I don't know if anyone's in chat to randomly trigger these things while I'm looking at it, but... Yep, 
upside it got away. Oh well. Uh, do my paid sound loading now? We'll see if it'll go through. Oh come on! Not even that one. I really wanted that one to work, right? Come on, play the sound. It just refuses. That's annoying. I swear I had him working just the other day. Why are you not working, sound alerts? It's just not working. It's just maddening, infuriating. It's drive me insane. And it wasn't a long trip to start with. Yeah. Come on. Well, let me check one more thing. See if I can let's refresh an OBS. One more time. Hope it works. Nope. Uh, such a disappointment. Why can't it just freaking work right? How hard is it to get something to work properly? Oh, uh, we're nine minutes in. <sighs> Sound alerts is being a general nuisance. I just don't know what's going on with that. But ten minutes in. Anyway, we are going back to the show of poems. We will try to do at least two stories tonight. I would like to get more than two stories, but it really depends on how much ice strain I deal with after a while. 
And of course, it would be really great if my mouth was cooperating more. But I'm not going to hold my breath. Or maybe I will. You won't know. Whew. Anyway. <clears throat> Our first story tonight. The five orange pips. When I glance over my notes and records of Sherlock Holmes's case between the years of 82 and 90, I am faced with so many which present strange and interesting features that it is no easy matter to know which to choose or which to leave. Some, however, have already gained publicity through the papers, and others have not offered a field of those particular qualities of my friend possessed in so high a degree and which it is the object of the papers to illustrate. Some, too, have baffled his analytical skill and would be, as narratives, beginning without an ending, while others have been but partially cleared up and have their explanations founded rather upon conjecture and surmise rather than the absolute logical proof which was so dear to him. There is, however, one of these last which was so remarkable in its details and so startling in its results that I am tempted to give some account of it in spite of the fact that there are points of, conduct of connection with it which have never been and probably never will be entirely cleared up. The year in 87 furnished us with a long series of cases of greater or less interest, of which I retain the records. Among my headings under the twelve months, I find an account of the adventure of the Paradol Chamber of the Amateur Meditant Society, which held a luxurious club in the lower vault of a furniture warehouse of the facts connected with this loss of the British bark Sophie Anderson of the singular adventures of Grice Patterson of the island of Ufa, and finally of the Camberwell poisoning case. In the latter, as may be remembered, Sherlock Holmes was able, by winding up the dead man's watch, to prove that it had been wound up two hours before, and that before the deceased had gone to bed within that time, a deduction which was the greatest importance in clearing up the case. All these I may sketch out at some future date, but none of them present such singular features as a strange train of circumstances which I have now taken up my pen to describe. It was the later days of September, and the equinoctial gales had set in the exceptional violence. All day the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against the windows, so that even here in the heart of great handmade London, we are forced to rise our minds for the instance of the routine of life, and to recognize the presence of those great elemental forces which shriek at mankind through the bars of his civilization like untamed beasts in a cage. As evening drew in, the storm grew higher and louder, and the wind cried and sobbed like a child in the chimney. Sherlock Holmes sat moodily at one side of the fireplace, cross-indexing his records of crime, while I at the other was deep in one of my Clock Russell's fine sea stories, until the howl of the gale from the out without seemed to blend in with the text, and a splash of rain to lengthen out into the long swash of the sea waves. My wife was on a visit to her mother's, and for a few days I was a dweller once more in my old quarters at Baker Street. Why, said I, glancing up at my companion, that was surely the bell. Who would come tonight? Some friend of yours, perhaps? Except yourself, I have none, he answered. I do not encourage visitors. A client, then? If so, it is a serious case. Nothing less would bring a man out in such a day and at such an hour. But I take it that it is more likely to be some crony of the landlady's. 
Sherlock Holmes was wrong in his conjecture, however, for there came a step in the passage and a tapping at the door. He stretched out his long arm to turn the lamp away from himself and towards the vacant chair upon which the newcomer must sit. Come in, he said. The man who entered was a young, some two and twenty at the outside, well-groomed and trimly clad, with something of a refinement and delicacy in his bearing. The steam, streaming umbrella which he held in his hand, and the, his long, shining windproof, told of the fierce weather through which he had come. He looked about him anxiously in the glare of the lamp, and I could see that his face was pale and his eyes heavy, like those of a man who is weighed down by some ghastly anxiety. I owe you an apology. He said, raising his golden pincers to his eyes. I trust that I'm not intruding. I fear that I have brought some traces of the storm and rain onto your snug chamber. Give me a coat and umbrella, said Holmes. They may rest here on the hook and will be dry presently. You have come up with the south side, I believe. Yes, I'm from Horsham. That clay and chalk mixture which I see upon your toe caps is quite distinctive. I have come for advice. That is easily got. And help? That is not always so easy. I have heard of you, Mr. Holmes. I've heard from Major Pendergast how you saved him in the Tankerville Club scandal. Ah, of course. He was wrongfully accused of cheating at cards. It said that you could solve anything. He said too much. That you're never beaten? I have been beaten four times. Three times by men, and once by a woman. But what does that compare to the number of your successes? It is true that I have been generally successful. Then you may have be so with me. I beg that you will draw up your chair by the fire and favor me with some details as to your case. It is no ordinary one. None of those which come to me are. I am the last court of appeal. And yet I question, sir, whether in all your experiences have you ever listened to a more mysterious and inexplicable chain of events than those that have happened to my own family. You fill me with interest, said Holmes. Pray give us the essential facts from the commencement, and I shall afterwards question you as to those details, which seem to me to be the most important. My name, he said is John Openshaw. But my own affairs have, as I, as far as I can understand, have little to do with the awful business. It is a hereditary matter, so in order to give me the idea of the facts, I must go back to the commencement of the affair. You must know that my grandfather had two sons, my uncle Elias and my father Joseph. My father had a small factory in Coventry, which he enlarged at the time of the invention of bicycling. He has a patentee of the open shop, Unbreakable Tire, and his business met with such success that he was able to sell it to retire upon a handsome consequence. My uncle Elias immigrated to America when he was a young man and became a planter in Florida, where he was reported to have done very well. At the time of the war, he fought with Jackson's army, and afterwards he rose to be a colonel. When Lee laid down his arms, my uncle returned to his plantation, where he remained for three or four years. About 1869 or 1870, he came back to Europe and took a small estate in Sussex, near Horsham. He made a very considerable fortune in the States, and his reason for leaving them was his aversion to the Negroes, and his dislike for the Republican Party in extending the franchise to them. He 
He was a singular man, fierce and quick-tempered, very foul-mouthed when he was angry, and the most retiring disposition. During all the war years that he lived in Horsham, I doubt if he ever set foot in the town. He had a garden and two or three fields around his house. There he would take his exercise, though very often for weeks on end he would never leave his room. He drank a great deal of brandy and smoked very heavily, but he would not see no society and did not want any friends, not even his own brother. He didn't mind me, in fact. He took a fancy to me, for at the time when he saw me I was a youngster of twelve or so. This would be in the year 1878, after he had been eight or nine years in England. He begged my father to let me live with him, and he was very kind to me in his way. When he was sober, he used to be fond of playing backgammon and draughts with me, and he would make me his representative both with the servants and with the tradespeople, so that by the time I was sixteen, I was quite master of the house. I kept all the keys, and I could go where I liked and do what I liked, as long as I did not disturb him in his privacy. There was one singular exception, however. He had a single room, a lumber room, up among the attics, which was never invariably locked, and which he would never permit me to go. With the boy's curiosity, I have peeped through the keyhole, and I was never able to see much beyond an old collection of trunks and bundles, as would be expected in such a room. One day, it was March 1883, a letter with a foreign stamp lay upon the table in front of the colonel's plate. It was not a common thing for him to receive letters, for his bills were all paid with ready money, and he had no friends of any sort. From India, said he, and he had to look it up. Pondicherry postmark. What can this be? Opening it hurriedly, out jumped three or five little dried orange pips, which pattered down upon its plate, and I began to laugh at this, but the laugh was struck from my lips with the side of his face. His lip had fallen, his eyes were protruding, his skin the color of putty, and he glared at the envelope which he still held in his trem trembling hands. K-K-K, he shrieked, and then, My God, my God, my sins have overtaken me. What is it, uncle? I cried. Death, said he, and rising from the table, he retired to his room, leaving me palpitating in horror. I took up the envelope and saw scrawled in red ink upon the inner flap, just above the gum, the letter K three times repeated. There was nothing else save for the five dried pips. What could be the reason of his overpowering terror? I left the breakfast table, and I ascended the stair, and I met him coming down with an old rusty key, which must have belonged to the attic, in one hand, and some small brass box, like a cash box, in the other. They do, they may do what they like, and I'll checkmate them still. And he said with an oath, Tell Mary that I shall want some fire in my room today, and send down to Fortham, and Horsham lawyer. I did as he ordered, and when the lawyer arrived, I was asked to step up to the room. The fire was burning brightly, and in the grate there was a mass of black fluffy ashes, as of burnt paper, while the brass box stood open and empty inside. As I glanced at the box, I noticed with a start that upon the lid was printed the tremble, the Trouble K, which I had read on the mo morning, open on the envelope. I wish you, John, said my uncle, to witness my will. I leave my estate with all the advantages and all its disadvantages to my brother, your father, whence it will no doubt descend to you. If you can enjoy it in peace, well and good. If you cannot, take my advice, my boy, and leave it to your deadliest enemy. I am sorry to give you such a two-edged two thing. But I can't say what things are going to take. Kindly sign the paper where Mr. Fordham shows you. I signed the paper as directed, and the lawyer took, a, took it away with him. The singular incident made, as you may think, the deepest impression upon me. 
and I pondered over it and turned it up every way in my mind without being able to make anything of it. Yet I could not shake off the vague feeling of dread which it left behind, though the sensation grew less keen as the weeks passed and nothing happened to disturb the usual routine of our lives. I could see a change in my uncle, however. He drank more often, and he was less inclined for any sort of society. Most of the time he would spend in his room with the door locked upon the inside, and sometimes he would emerge in the sort of drunken frenzy and would burst out of the house and tear about the garden with a revolver in his hand, screaming out that he was afraid of no man and that he was not to be cooped up like a sheep in a pen by man or devil. When these hot fits were over, however, he would rush tumultuously back in the door, locked it, and barred it behind him. Like a man who can brazen it out no longer against the terror which lies at the root of his soul. At such times I have seen his face, even on a cold day, glistening with moisture, as though it were new raised from the basin. Well, to come to an end of the matter, Mr. Holmes, and not to abuse your patience, there came a night when he made one of those drunken sallies from which he never came back. We found him, and we went to search for him, and face downward in a little green scummed pool which lay at the foot of the garden. There was no sign of any violence, and the water was just two feet deep, so that the jury, having regard to his own eccentricity, brought the verdict of suicide. But I, who knew how he winced from the very thought of death, had much ado to persuade myself that he had gone this way and to meet it. The matter passed, however, and my father entered the possession of the estate and of some fourteen thousand pounds which lay to his credit at the bank. One moment, Holmes interposed. Your statement is, I foresee, one of the most remarkable I've had ever listened to. Let me have the date of the reception by your uncle of the letter, and the date of his supposed suicide. The letter arrived on March 10th, 1883. His death was seven weeks after, upon the night of May 2nd. Thank you. Pray proceed. When my father took over the Holsham property, he, at my request, made a careful examination of the attic, which had been always locked up. We found the brass box there, although its contents had been destroyed. On the inside of the cover was a paper label with the initials of KKK repeated upon it, and letters, memoranda, receipts, and a register written beneath. These, we presume, indicated the nature of the papers which he had destroyed by Colonel Openshaw. For the rest, there was nothing of much importance in the attic save for a great many scattered papers and notebooks bearing my uncle's life in America. Some of them were of the wartime and showed that he had done his brave duty as well as had borne the repute of a brave soldier. Others were of dates during the reconstruction of the southern states, and were mostly concerned with politics, for he had evidently taken a strong part in opposing the carpetbag politicians who had been sent down from the north. Well, it was the beginning of 84 when my father came to live at Horsham, and all went as well as possible until January of 85. On the fourth day after the new year, I heard my father give a sharp cry of surprise as we sat together in the breakfast table. There he was, sitting with a newly opened envelope in one hand and five dried orange pips and an outstretched palm of the other one. He had always laughed at what he called my cock and bull story about the colonel, but he looked very scared and puzzled now that the same thing had come upon him. What on earth does it mean, John? he stammered. My heart had turned to the lead. It's the KKK, said I. 
He looked inside the envelope. So it is, he cried. Here are the very letters, but what is this written before them? Put the papers on the sundial, I read, peeping over his shoulder. What papers? What sundial? he asked. The sundial in the garden. There is no other, said I. But the papers must be those that are destroyed. Pooh, he said, gripping at his courage. We are a civilized land here, and can't have Tom Ford of the kind. Where does this thing come from? From Dundee, I answered, glancing at the postmark. Some preposterous practical joke, said he. What have I to do with sundials and papers? I shall make no notice of such nonsense. I should certainly speak to police, I said. And he laughed at my pains. Nothing of the sort. Let me do it. No, I forbid you. I won't have any fuss made about such nonsense. It was in vain to argue with him, and he was a very obstinate man. I went about, however, with a heart which was full of foreboding. On the third day after the coming of the letter, my father went from home to visit an old friend, his major freebody, who was in command of one of the forts upon Portston Hill. I was glad he should go, for it seemed to me that he was farther from danger when he was away from home. And that, however, and I was in error. Upon the second day of his absence, I received a telegram from the Major imploring me to come at once. My father had fallen over into the deep chalk pits which abound in the neighborhood, and was lying senseless, with a shattered skull. I hurried to him, but he passed away without ever having recovered his consciousness. He had, as it appears, been returning from Fareham when the two light and the country was unknown to him, and the chalk pit unfenced. The jury had no hesitation to bring in the verdict of death from accidental causes. Carefully as I examined every fact and connected with his death, I was unable to find anything which could suggest the idea of murder. There were no signs of violence, no footmarks, no robbery, no record of strangers having been seen upon the roads. And yet... I need not tell you that my mind was far from his ease, and that I was well nigh certain that some foul plot had been woven around him. In this sinister way I came into my inheritance. You ask me why I did not dispose of it. I answer because I was well convinced that our troubles were in some way dependent upon the accidents of my uncle's life and that the danger would not be pressing in one house as in another. It was in January 85 that my poor father met his end, and two years and eight months have elapsed since then. During that time I have lived happily at Horsham, and I have begun to hope that this curse had passed away from my family, and that it had ended with the last generation. I had begun to take comfort too soon, however. Yesterday morning... The blow fell of the very shape in which it had come upon my father. The young man took from his waistcoat a crumpled letter, and turning it on the table, shook out upon it the five little dried orange pips. This is the envelope, he continued. The postmark is London, Eastern Division. With under the very words which were upon my father's last message. KKK, and then put the papers on the sundial. What have you done? asked Holmes. Nothing. Nothing? To tell the truth, he sank his face into his thin white hands. I have felt helpless. I have felt like one of those poor rabbits when the snake is writhing towards it. I seem to be in the grasp of some res resistless, inexorable evil with no foresight, no precautions to guard against it. Tut, tut, cried Sherlock Holmes. You must act, man, or you are lost. Nothing but energy can save you. This is no time for despair. I have seen the police. Uh, but they listened to the story with a smile, and convinced that the inspector was 
formed an opinion of the letters as a practical joke, and that the depths of my relations are really accidents, as the jury stated, and and were not to be concerned connected with the warnings. Holmes shook his clenched hands in the air. Incredible imbecility! he cried. They have, however, allowed me a policeman who may remain at my house with me. Has he come with you tonight? No, his orders were to stay in the house. Again, Holmes raved in the air. Why did you come to me, he cried. And above all, why did you not come at once? I did not know. It was only today when I spoke to Major Pendergast about my troubles and was advised by him to come to you. It is really two days since you had the letter. We should have acted before this. You have no further evidence, I suppose, that which detail in the place before us. No suggestive detail which might help us. There is one thing, said John Openshaw. He rummaged in his coat pockets, drawing out a piece of discolored, blue-tinted paper. He laid it out upon the table. I have some resemblance, remembrance, he said, that on the day when my uncle burned the papers, I observed that small, unburned margins which lay amid the ashes in a particular color. I found a single sheet upon the floor of his room. I am inclined to think that it may be one of the papers which has perhaps floated away from the others, and in that way has escaped destruction. Beyond the mention of Pips, I do not see that it helps us much. I think myself at the page from his private diary. The writing is undoubtedly my uncle's. Holmes moved the lamp, and we both bent over the sheet of paper, which showed to be by its ragged edge that it was indeed torn from a book. It was headed March 1869, and beneath were the following enigmatical notes. Fourth, Hudson came, same plantation. Seventh, set the pips on McCartney, Paramore, John Swaim of St. Augustine. Ninth, Macaulay cleared. Tenth, John Swain cleared. Twelfth, visited Paramore. All well. Thank you, said Holmes, folding up the paper and returning it to his our visitor. Now you must on no account lose another instant. We cannot spare your time even to discuss what you have told me. You must get home instantly and act. What shall I do? There's but one thing to do. It must be done at once. You must put this piece of paper which you have shown us into the brass box which you have described. You must also put the note to say that all the pieces of paper were burned by your uncle, and this is the only way one which remains. You must assert that in such words as will carry conviction with them. Having done this, you must put the box at once upon the sundial as directed. Do you understand? Entirely. Do not think of revenge or anything of the sort at present. I think that we may gain that by means of the law. But we have our web to weave, and theirs is already woven. The first consideration is to remove the pressing danger that threatens you. The second is to clear up any mystery as to the punishment of the guilty parties. I thank you, said the young man, rising and pulling up his trench coat. You have given me fresh life and hope. I shall certainly do as you advise. Do not lose an instant, and above all, take care of yourself in the meanwhile, for I do not think that there can be a doubt that you are threatened by a very real and imminent danger. How do you go back? By train from Waterloo. It is not yet nine. The streets will be crowded. So do not trust that you may be in safety. And yet, you cannot guard yourself too closely. I am armed. That is well. Tomorrow I shall set work upon your case. I shall see you in Horsham, then? No, your secret lies in London. It is there I shall seek it. Then I shall call upon you in a day, and we're in two days, the news of the boxes and the papers. 
I shall take your advice in very particular order. He shook his hands with us and took his leave. Outside, the wind was still screaming and the rain splashed and pattered against the windows. This strange, wild story seemed to have come to us from amid the mad elements, blown in upon us like a sheet of weed on the gale, and now to have reabsorbed by them once more. Sherlock Holmes sat for some time in silence, with his head sunk forward and his eyes bent on the red glowing of the fire. Then he lit his pipe, and leaning back in his chair, he watched the blue ring smoke rings as they chased each other up to the ceiling. I think, Watson, he remarked at last, that of all our cases we have had some more fantastic than this. Well, perhaps the sign of four. Oh, yes, say, perhaps that. And yet Sir John Openshaw seems to me to be the walking amid even greater perils than that of Strotus. But have you, I asked, formed any definite conclusion as to what the perils are? There can be no question of this nature, he answered. Then what are they? Who is this KKK, and why does he pursue this unhappy family? Sherlock Holmes closed his eyes and placed his elbows upon the arms of his chair, and with his fingertips together. The ideal reasoner, he remarked, would, when he had been shown the single fact in all its bearings, deduce from it not only that the chain of events which led up to it, but also the, the results which would follow from it, as Cuvier could correctly describe a whole animal by the contemplation of a single bone, to the observer who has thoroughly understood one link in the series of incidents, should be able to accurately state all the other ones, both before and after. We have not yet grasped the results which the reason alone can, can attain to. Problems may be solved in the study which have baffled all those who have sought a solution by the aid of their senses. To carry the art, however, to the highest pitch, is it is necessary that the reasoner should be able to utilize all the facts which have come to his knowledge, and this in its belief implies, as you will readily see, a possession of all knowledge which, even in these days of free education and encyclopedias, is a somewhat rare accomplishment. It is not impossible, however, that a man should possess all knowledge which is likely to be useful to him in his work, and this I have endeavored in my case to do so. If I remember correctly, you on one occasion, in the early days of our friendship, defined my limits in a very precise fashion. Yes, I answered, laughing. It was a singular document. Philosophy, astronomy, and politics were marked at zero, as I remember. Botany variable, geology profound, as regards the mudstains of the region of fifteen miles of town, chemistry-centric, chemistry anatomy-unsystematic, sensational literature, and a crime records unique, violin player, boxer, swordsman, lawyer, and self-poisoner by cocaine and tobacco. Those, I think, were the main points of my analysis. Holmes grimmed at the time. Well, he said, I say now, as I say then, that a man should be kept his little brain addled shock with the furniture that he is likely to use, and the rest he can put away in the lumber room in his library, where he can get to it if he wants it. Now, for such a case as the one we have been submitted to, we need certainly to muster all our resources. Kindly hand me down the letter K from the American Encyclopedia, which stands on the shelf beside you. Thank you. Now let us consider the situation and see what may be deduced from it. In the first place, we may start with a strong presumption that Colonel Openshaw had some very strong reason for leaving America. Men at his time of life do not change all their habits in exchange for willing for charming climates in Florida for the lonely life of an English provincial town. His extreme love for the solitude of England suggests the idea that he was in fear of something or someone, so we may assume as a working hypothesis that it was fear of someone or something which drove him from America. 
As to what it was he feared, we can only deduce that it is a considering of the formidable letters which were received by himself and his successors. Do you remark the postmarks of those letters? The uh, first was Pondicherry, the second from Dundee, and the third from London. From East London. What do you deduce from that? Well, there are all seaports, and the writer was on board of a ship. Excellent. We have already a clue. There can be no doubt that it's the probability, the strong probability, is that the writer was on board of a ship. And now let us consider another point. In the case of Pondicherry, seven weeks elapsed between the threat and its fulfillment. It is Dundee, it is not only three or four days. Does that suggest anything? A greater distance of travel. But the letter also had a greater distance to come. Then I do not see the point. There is at least a presumption that the vessel in which the man or men are is a sailing ship. It looks as if they always sent their singular warning or token before them when starting on the mission. You see how quickly the deed followed the sign when it came to Dundee. If there had come from Pondicherry and a steamer, it would have arrived almost as soon as their letter. But, as a matter of fact, seven weeks elapsed. I think that those seven weeks represented the difference between a main boat that's mail, that brought the letter to the sailing vessel which brought the writer. It is possible. More than that, it's probable. And now you see the deadly urgency of the new case, and why I urge young Openshaw with caution. The blow has always taken has always fallen at the end of some time it would take the senders to travel the distance. But this one comes from London, therefore we cannot count upon a delay. Good God! I cried. What can it mean? This, relev this relentless persecution! The papers which Openshaw carried are obviously of vital importance to the person of persons in the sailing ship. I think that it is quite clear that there must be some more than one of them. A single man could not have carried out two deaths in such a way as to deserve a coroner's jury. There must have been several in it, and they must be men of resource and determination. There are papers they mean to have, and be the holder of them it may be. In this way, you can see KKK ceases to be the initials of an individual and becomes a badge of a society. But what society? Have you never, said Sherlock Holmes, spending forward and sinking his voice, heard, have you never heard of the Ku Klux Klan? I never have. Holmes turned over the leaves of the book upon the knee. Here it is, said presently. Ku Klux Klan, a name derived with a fanciful resemblance of a sound pronounced by a cocking of a rifle. This terrible society was formed by some ex-Confederate soldiers in southern states after the Civil War. It has rapidly formed local branches in multiple parts of the country, notably in Tennessee, Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. Its power was used for political purposes, principally for the terrorizing of Negro voters and the murdering of driving t from the country of those who are opposed to its views. Its outrages were usually preceded by a warning since by the marked man in some fantastic but generally recognized shape. A sprig of oak leaves in some parts, melon seeds or orange pips in others. On receiving this, the victim might either bravely abjure his former ways, or might fly from the country. If he braved the matter out, death would unfallingly come upon him, and usually in some strange and unforeseen manner. So perfect was the organization of the society, that in the systematic methods, that there is hardly a case upon record where any man succeeded in braving it with impunity or in which any of its outrages were traced home to the perpetrators. 
For some years, the organization flourished in spite of the efforts of the United States government and of the better classes of the community in the South. Eventually, in the year 1869, the movement rather suddenly collapsed. Wish. Although there have been sporadic outbreaks of the same sort since that date. You observe, said Holmes, laying down the volume, that the sudden breaking up of society was coincidental with the disappearance of Openshaw from the America with their papers. It may be, well be that the cause and effect. It is no wonder that he and his family have some of the more implacable spirits on, on, upon their track. You can understand that this register and diary may implicate some of the first men in the South, and that there may be covered many that will not sleep until it is recovered. And the page we've seen is such as we might expect. It ran, if I remember right, sent a pips to A, B, and C, that is, sent the society's warning to them, and there are successive c entries that's A, B, and left the country, and finally that C was visited with, I fear, a sinister result for C. Well, I think, Doctor, that we may let some light into this dark place. And I believe that the only chance young Openshaw has in the meantime is to do what I have told him to. There is nothing more to be said or to be done tonight, so hand me over my violin and let us try to forget for half an hour the miserable weather and the still more miserable ways of our fellow men. It had cleared in the morning, and the sun was shining with subdued brightness through the dim veil which hangs over this great city. Sherlock Holmes was already at breakfast when I came down. You'll excuse me for not waking you, he said. I have, I foresee, a very busy day ahead of me looking into this case of young Openshaws. What steps will you take? I asked. It will very much be depend upon the results of my first inquiries. I may go down to, to Horsham, after all. You will not go there first? No. I shall commence in the city. Just ring the bell, and the maid will bring you your coffee. As I waited, I lifted the unopened newspaper from the table and glanced my eye over it. It rested upon the headline which sent a chill into my heart. Holmes, I cried. They are too late. Ah, said he, laying down his cup. I feared as much. How is it done? He spoke calmly, but I could see that he was deeply moved. My sight caught the name of the Chairman Openshaw and the heading Tragedy Near Waterloo Bridge. Here's the account. Between nine and ten last night, Police Constable Cook of the H Division on duty near Waterloo Bridge, heard a cry for help and a splash in the water. The night, however, was extremely dark and stormy, so that, in spite of the help of several passerbys, it was quite impossible to effect a rescue. The alarm, however, was given, and, by the aid of the queue, by the aid of the water police, the body was eventually recovered. It proved to be that of the young gentleman whose name, as it appears from an envelope which was found in his pocket, was John Openshaw, and whose residence is near Horsham. It is conjectured that he may be hurrying down to catch the last train from Waterloo Station, and that in his haste and his extreme darkness he missed the path and walked over the edge of one of the small landing places for the river steamboats. The body exhibited no traces of violence, and there can be no doubt that the deceased had been the victim of an unfortunate accident, which should have been the effect of calling the attention of the authorities to the condition of the Riverside landing stages. We sat in silence for some moments. Holmes, de more depressed and shaken than I had ever seen him. That hurts my pride, Watson, he said at last. It is petty feeling, no doubt, but it hurts my pride. It becomes a personal matter with me now, and if God sends me health, 
I shall set my hand upon this gang, that he should come to me for help, and that I should send him away to his death. He sprang from his chair and paced about the room in an uncontrollable agitation, with a flush upon his sallow cheeks and a nervous clasping and unclasping of his long, thin hands. They must be cunning devils, he exclaimed at last. How could they have decoyed him down there? The embarkment is not in the direct line of the station. The bridge, no doubt, was too crowded, even on such a night as for their purpose. Well, Watson, we shall see who will win in the long run. I'm going out now. To the police? No, I shall be my own police. When I have spun the web, they may take the flies, but not before. All day as I was engaged in my professional work, and it was late in the evening before I returned to Baker Street. Sherlock Holmes had not yet come back, and it was nearly ten o'clock before he entered, looking pale and worn. He walked up to the sideboard, and tearing a piece from the loaf, he devoured it voraciously, washing it down with a long draught of water. You're hungry, I remarked. Starving. If I'd escaped my memory, I have nothing since breakfast. Nothing? Not a bite. I had no time to think of it. And have you succeeded? Well? You have a clue. I have them in the hall of my hand. Your open shire shall not remain unavenged. Why, Watson, let us put their own devilish trademark upon them. It is well thought of. <laughs> what do you mean? He took an orange from the cupboard, and tearing into it, he squeezed the, at the pips onto the table. Of these, he took five and thrust them into an envelope. On the side of the envelope, he wrote S.J. for J.O. Then he sealed it and addressed it to Captain James Calhoun, Mark Lone Star, Savannah, Georgia. That will await him when he enters port, and he, chuckling, it may give him a sleepless night. He will find it to be a precursor of his fate, as Openshaw did before him. And who is it? Captain Calhoun? The leader of the gang. I shall have the others, but he first. How did you trace it, then? He took a large sheet of paper from his pocket and he covered it with dates and names. I have spent the whole day, he said. Over Lloyd's registers and files of old papers, following the future career of every vessel which touched the pot and cherry in January and February in 83. There were 36 ships of fair tonnage which were reported during those. One of these, the Lone Star, instantly attracted my attention, since although it was reported of having cleared from London, the name is that of which was given to one of the states of the Union. Texas, I think. I was not, and I'm not sure which, but I drew the ship must have been of American origin. What then? I searched the Dundee records, and when I found that the Mark Lone Star had there in January in 85, my suspicion became a certainty. Then I inquired as to which vessels which lay in the present port of London. Yes? The Lone Star had arrived there last week. I went down to Albert Dock and found that she had been taken down by the river by the early tide this morning, homeward bound to Savannah. I wired the Gravesend and learned that she had passed some time, and that the wind was easterly. I have no doubt that she has now passed the good ones, and not very far from the Isle of Wight. What will you do now? Oh, I have my hand upon them. He and two mates are, as I learned, are the only native-born Americans in the ship. The others are Finns and Germans. I know, also, that they were all three away from the ship that night. Had it from the stonefire who had been loading the ship. By the time that their sailing ship arrived in Savannah, by the mailboat, will be carried to this letter. And the cable will have informed the police of Savannah that three gentlemen were badly wanted here upon the charge of murder. And there is ever a flaw, however, 
and the best land of human plans that the murderers of John Openshaw were never to receive the orange pips which would allow them to land upon the other, as cunning and as resolute themselves was upon their track. Very long and very severe were the eloquential gales that year. We waited long for news of the Savannah and of the Lone Star of Savannah, but none ever reached us. We did at last hear that somewhere out on the far Atlantic a shattered stern post of the boat had been swinging in the trough of a wave, with the letters L.S. carved upon it. And that is all which we know of the late Lone Star. <clears throat> Did not expect the story of Sherlock Holmes versus the KKK. I know I'd read it before, but I'd completely forgotten about it. <laughs> But anyway. <clears throat> Our second story for the night. The man with the twisted lip. Mr. Whitney, brother of the late Elias Whitney, D.D., principal of the OG College of St. George's, was much addicted to opium. The habit grew upon him, as I understand, from some foolish freak when he was at college. For having read De Quincey's description of his dreams and sensations, he had drenched his tobacco and laudium in an attempt to produce the same effects. He found, as so many have done before, that the practice is easier to attain than to get rid of, and for many years he continued to be a slave to the drug, and objects of mingled horror and pity to his friends and relatives. I can see him now, with yellow, pasty face, drooping lids, and pinpoint pupils, all huddled in a chair, the wreck and ruin of a noble man. One night, it was June of eighty-nine, there came a ring to my bell, about an hour when the man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock. I sat up in my chair, my wife laid her needlework down on her lap and made a little face of disappointment. A patient, she said. You have to go out. I groaned, for I was newly come back from a weary day. We heard the door open and a few hurried words, and then a quick steps into the linoleum. Our own door flew open, a lady, clad in some dark-colored stuff, with the black veil, entered the room. You'll excuse my call so late, she began. And then, suddenly losing her self-control, ran forward, threw her arms around my wife's neck, and sobbed her in her shoulder. I'm in so much trouble, she cried. I do want so little help. Why, said my wife, pulling up her veil, it is Kate Whitney. How you have startled me, Kate. I had not any idea that you were who you were when you came in. I didn't know what to do when I came straight to you. That was always the way. Folk who were in grief came to my wife like birds to a lighthouse. It was very sweet of you to come. Now, you must have some wine and water. Sit here comfortably and tell us all about it. Or should you rather that I sent James off to bed? No, no, no. I want the doctor's advice and him too. It's about Isa. He's not been home for two days. I'm so frightened about him. It was not the first time that she had spoken to us of her husband's troubles, to me as a doctor, or to my wife as an old friend and school companion. We soothed and comforted her by such words as we could find. Did she know where her husband was? Was it possible that he could not bring him back to her? It seems that it was. She had the serious information that of late he had, 
When the fit hit him, he made use of the opium den in the farthest east of the city. Hitherto, his orgies had been confirmed to one day, and he had come back twitching and shattered in the evening. But now the spell had been upon the eight and, for the eight and forty hours, and he lay there, doubtless among the dregs and docks, breathing in the poison or sleeping off the effects. And there he was to be found, she was sure of it, at the bar of gold in Upper Swandom Lane. But what was she to do? What could she, a young and timid woman, make her way into such a place and pluck her husband out from the, among the ruffians that surrounded him? That was the case, and, of course, there was but one way out of it. Might I not escort her to this place? And then, as a second thought, why should she come at all? I was Isam Whitney's medical advisor, and as such I had influence over him. I could manage it better if I were alone. I promised her my word that I would send him home in a cab within two hours if he were indeed at the address which she had given me. And so in ten minutes I had left my armchair and cheery sitting room behind me, and was speeding eastward to the handsome and a strange errand, as it seemed to be me at the time. Though the future only could show how strange it was to be. But there was no great difficulty in the first stage of my adventure. Upper Swindon Lane is a vile alley lurking behind the high wharves, which line the north side of the river to the east of London Bridge. While between a slop shop and a gin shop, approaching a steep flight of steps leading down to the black gap at the mouth of a cave, I found the den of which I was in search. Ordering my cab to wait, I passed down the steps and bore hollow to the center of the ceaseless tread of drunken feet, and by the light of flickering oil lamp by the door, I found the latch and made my way into a long, low room, thick and heavy with brown opium smoke, and traced with wooden barris, like a forecastle of an emigrant ship. There in the gloom, one could dimly catch glimpses of bodies lying in strange, fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back, and chins pointing upward. And here and there, a dark, lackluster eye turned upon the newcomer. Out of the black shadows, a glimmer of little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as the burning potion waxed and waned in the bowels of the metal pipes. The most lay silent, and some muttered to themselves, and others talked together in a strange, low, monotonous voice, the conversation coming in gushes, and then suddenly trailing off into silence, each mumbling out his own thoughts, and paying little heed to the words of his neighbor. At the farther end, a small brazier of burning charcoal, beside which, on a three-legged wooden stool sat a tall, thin old man, with his jaw resting upon his two fists, and his elbows upon his knees, staring into the fire. As I entered, so Malay attendant came hurried up to me, with a pipe and a supply of the drug, beckoning me to an empty booth. "'Thank you, I have not come to stay,' said I. "'There is a friend of mine here, Mr. Isla Whitley.' And uh, I wish to speak with him. There was a moment to an exclamation from my right. Peering through the gloom, I saw Whitney, pale, haggard, and unkempt, staring out at me. My God, it's Watson, he said. He was a pitiable state of reaction, with every nerve in a twitter. I say, Watson, what time is it? Nearly eleven. Of what day? Of Friday, June 19th. Good heavens, I thought it was Wednesday. It is Wednesday. What did you do to frighten a chap for? He sank his face into his arms and began to sob in a high treble key. I tell you that it isn't Friday, man. Your wife has been waiting for this two days for you, and you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> so I am. 
But you've got mixed, Watson, for I have only been here a few hours. Three pipes, four pipes, uh, forget how many. But I'll go home with you. I wouldn't frighten Kate. Poor little Kate. Give me your hand. Have you a cab? Yes, I have one waiting. Then I shall go in it. But I must owe something. Find me what I owe, Watson. I am all off color. I can do nothing for myself. I walk down the narrow passage between the doable rows of sleepers, holding my breath to keep out the vile, stupefying flumes of the drug, and looking about for the manager. As I passed the tall man who sat in the brazier, I felt sudden pluck at my shirt, and a low voice whispered, Walk past me and look back at me. The words fell quite distinctly upon my ear. I glanced down. They could have only come from the old man at my side, yet he sat in as absorbed as ever. Very thin, very wrinkled, bent with age, an opium pipe dangling down between his knees, as though it had been dropped in a sheer lassitude of his fingers. I took two steps forward and looked back. It took all my self-control to prevent me from breaking out under a cry of astonishment. He had turned his back so that none could see him but I. His form had filled out, his wrinkles were gone, the dull eyes had regained their fire, and there, sitting by the fire and grinning at my surprise, was none other than Sherlock Holmes. He made a slight motion to me to approach him, and instantly, as he turned his face round to the room and company again, subsided into a doddering, loose-lipped senility. Holmes, I whispered, what on earth are you doing in this den? As low as you can, he answered. I have excellent ears. If you should, if you would want to have the great kindness to rid of that sottish friend of yours, I should be exceedingly glad to have a little talk with you. I have a cab outside. And pray send him home in it. You may safely trust him, for he appears to be too limp to get into any mischief. I should recommend you also spend a send a note to his cabman to, his, to your wife to say that you have thrown in your, your lot with me. If you will wait outside, I shall be with you in five minutes. It was difficult to refuse any of Sherlock Holmes's requests, and they were always exceedingly diffident, and put forward in such a quiet air of mastery. I felt, however, that when Whitney was once confined to the cab of my mission was practically accomplished, and for the rest I could not wish anything better than to be associated with my friend in one of those singular adventures which were the normal condition of his existence. In a few minutes I had written the note, paid Whitby's bill, and led him out to the cab, and seen him driven through the darkness. In a very short time a decrepit figure had emerged from the opium den, and I was walking down the street with Sherlock Holmes. For two streets he shuffled along with a bent back and with uneasy uncertain foot, then, glancing around quickly, he straightened himself out and burst into a heavy fit of laughter. <laughs> I suppose, Watson, he said, that you can imagine me to be opium addled and cocaine inje injections, and all other little weaknesses on which you have favored me with your medical views. I was certainly surprised to find you there, but no more than, but no more so than I have you. I came to find a friend, and I to find an enemy. An enemy? Yes. One of my natural enemies, or shall I say, my natural prey. Briefly, Watson, I am in the midst of a very remarkable inquiry, and I have hoped to find a clue in the incoherent ramblings of these sots, and I have done before now. Had I been recognized in that den, my life would have been, not been worth an hour's purchase, for I have used it before now for my own purpose and the rascal who runs it has sworn to have vengeance upon me. And there's a trapdoor at the back of the building, near the corner of Paul's Wharf, which could tell some strange tales of what has passed 
through it on the moonless nights. And what do you mean, bodies? Ah, Watson. We would be rich men if we had a thousand pounds for every poor devil who has been done to death down that den. It is the vilest murder trap in the whole riverside, and I fear that Neville St. Clair has entered it never to leave it more. But our trap should be here. He put his two forefingers between his teeth and whistled shrilly, a signal which was answered by a similar whistle from a distance, followed shortly by the rattle of wheels and the clink of horses' hooves. Now, Watson, said Holmes, and the tall dog cart dashed up to the gloom, throwing two golden tunnels of light at her lanterns. You'll come with me, won't you? If I can be of use. Oh, a trusty comrade is always of use, and a chronicler is still more so. My room at the Cedars is double bedded one. The Cedars? Yes, that is Mr. St. Clair's house. I am staying there while he conducts my inquiry. Where is it, then? Near Lee, in Kent. We have a seven-mile drive before us. But I'm all in the dark. Of course you are. John, <laughs> you know about it presently. Jump in here. All right, John. We shall need you. Oh, not need you. Here's half a crown. Look for me tomorrow about eleven. Give her her head. And so long, then. He flipped the horse with his whip, and we dashed away through the endless succession of somber and deserted streets, which widened gradually until we were flying across a broad, balustrade bridge, with a murky river flowing shruggishly beneath us. Beyond lay another dull wilderness of bricks and mortar, and its silence broken only by a heavy, regular footfall of the policemen, or the songs and shouts of some belated party of revelers. A dull rack was drifting slowly across the sky and a star, or two twinkled dimly there and through the rifts of the clouds. Holmes drove in silence with his head sunk upon his breast, and a man of you know, the air of a man who was lost in thought, while I sat beside him, curious to learn who this new quest might be, seemed to tax his powers so sorely. And yet, afraid to break upon the current of his thoughts, we had driven several miles and were beginning to get to the fringe of the belt of the suburban villas. When he stood and shook himself, shrugging his shoulders, he lit up his pipe in the air with a man who was satisfied himself that he was acting for the best. You have a grand drift of silence, Watson, he said. It makes you quite invaluable as a companion. Upon my word, it is a great thing for me to have someone to talk to, for my own thoughts are not over pleasant. I was wondering what I should say to this little dear woman tonight when she meets me at the door. You forget that I know nothing about it. I shall just have time to tell you the facts of the case before we get to Lee. It seems absurdly simple, and yet somehow I can get nothing to go upon. There's plenty of thread, no doubt, but I can't get to the end of it into my hand. Now, I'll state the case clearly and concisely to you, Watson, and maybe you can see a spark where all the dark to me. Proceed, then. Some years ago, to be definite, May 1884, there came to the a gentleman, Neville St. Clair by name, who appeared to have plenty of money. He took a large villa, laid out the grounds very nicely, lived generally in a good style. By degrees he made friends in the neighborhood, and in 1887 he married the daughter of a local brewer, by whom he now has two children. He had an occupation, but was interested in several companies, and went into town as a rule in the morning, returning by 5.14 from Cannon Street every night. Mr. St. Clair is now 37 years of age, is a man of temperate habits, a good husband, and a very affectionate father, and a man who is popular with all who know him. I may add that this whole debt at the present moment, so far as we have been able to ascertain, an amount of 88 pounds and silver. And while he has £220 standing to his credits in the capital and county's bank, 
There is no reason, therefore, to think that money troubles have been weighing upon his mind. Last Monday, Mr. Neville St. Clair went to the town rather earlier than usual, remarking before he started that he had two important commissions to perform, and that he would bring his little boy home in a box of bricks. Now, by the merest chance, the wife received a telegram upon the same Monday, very shortly after his departure, to the effect that a small parcel of considerable value, which she was has been expecting, was waiting for her at the offices of Aberdeen Shipping Company. Now, if you are all well up in your London, you will know that the office of the company is in Fresno Street, which branches out to Upper Swandham Lane, where you found me tonight. Mrs. St. Clair had her lunch, started for the city, did some shopping, proceeded to the company's office, got her packet, and found herself exactly at 4.35, walking through Swandham Lane on her way back to the station. Have you followed me so far? It is quite clear. If you remember, Monday was an exceedingly hot day, and Mrs. St. Clair walked slowly, glancing about in the hopes of seeing a cab. As she did not like the neighborhood in which she found herself. While she was walking in this way down Sundom Lane, she suddenly heard an ejaculation or cry, and was struck cold to see her husband looking down at her, and it seemed to her beckoning to her from the second floor window. The window was open, and she distinctly saw his face, which she describes as being terribly agitated. He waved his hands frantically to her, and then vanished from the window so suddenly that it seemed to her that he had been plucked back by some irresistible force to be from behind. One singular point which struck her quite feminine eyes was that although he wore some dark coat as he was stated to in town, he had neither collar nor necktie. Convinced that something was amiss with him, she rushed down the steps, for the house was none other than the opium den in which you found me tonight, and running through the front, she attempted to ascend the stairs which led to the first floor. At the foot of the stairs, however, she met with a celestial scoundrel from whom I have spoken, who had thrust her back and, aided by a Dane, who acts as an assistant there, pushed her out into the street. Filled with the most maddening doubts and fears, she rushed down the lane and, by rare good fortune, met in Fresno Street a number of constables with an inspector all their way down from the beat. The inspector and two men accompanied her back, and in spite of the continued resistance from the proprietor, they made their way into the room in which Miss, Mr. St. Clair had last been seen. There was no sign of him there. In fact, in the hole of the floor there was no one to be found, save a crippled wretch with hideous aspect who, it seems, made his home there. Both he and the lasser stoutly swore that no one had been in the front room during the afternoon. So determined at their denial that the inspector was staggered, and had almost come to believe that Mrs. St. Clair had been deluded when a cry she sprang at in a small deal box which lay in the table, and tore the lid from it. Out of there fell a cascade of children's bricks. It was a toy which he had promised to bring home. This discovery, and the evident confusion which the crippled showed, made, a spectacular reali made the inspector realize that the matter was serious. The rooms were carefully examined, and results all pointed in the abomination, abominable crime. The front room was plainly furnished as a sitting room, and led into a small bedroom, which looked out upon the back of the, one of the wharves. Between the wharf and the bedroom window is a narrow strip which is dry at low tide, but is covered in high tide, with at least four and a half feet of water. The bedroom window was a broad one, and opened from below. On examination, traces of blood were to be seen on the window sill, and several scattered drops were visible on the wooden floor of the bedroom. Thrust away behind the curtain, in the front room, were all the clothes of Mr. Neville St. Clair, with the exception of his coat. His boots, his socks, his hat, and his watch were all there. 
There were no signs of violence upon any of these garments, and there were no other traces of Mr. Neville St. Clair. At the window, he must have apparently gone, and for no exit other than that was discovered, and the ominous bloodstains upon the sill gave little promise that he could save himself by swimming, for the tide was at its very highest at the moment of the tragedy. And now, as the villains who seemed to be eminently impl implicated in the matter, the Lasker was known to be a man of the vilest antecedents, but as by Mrs. St. Clair's story, he was known to have been at the foot of the stair within the very few seconds of her husband's appearance at the window. He could hardly have been more than an accessory to the crime. His defense was one of absolute ignorance, and he protested that he had no knowledge of the doings of Hugh, Hugh Boone, its lodger, and that he could not account in any way the presence of the missing gentleman's clothes. So much for the Lancaster manager. Now for the sinister cripple who lives on the second floor in the opium den, who was certainly the last human being whose eyes rested upon Neville St. Clair. His name is Yu Boon, and his hideous face is one of familiar to every man who goes into the city. He is a professional beggar, though in order to avoid the police regulations, he pretends to be a small trade in wax vistas. Some little distance down Threadneedle Street, upon the left hand side, there is, as you may have remarked, a small angle in the wall. There, here it is that the creature takes his daily seat, cross legged, with his tiny stock of matches on his lap, and as he is a piteous spectacle, a small rain of charity descends upon his greasy leather hat, which lies upon the pavement beside him. I have watched the fellow more than once before though I have ever seen painstaking professional acquaintance, and I have surprised at the harvest in which he has reaped in a short time. His appearance, you see, is so remarkable that no one can pass him without observing him. The shock of orange hair, a pale face disfigured by a horrible scar, which, by its contra contradiction, has turned up the outer edge of his upper lip a bulldog chin, and a pair of very penetrating dark eyes, which present a singular contrast to the color of his hair. I'll mark him out in front of amid the crowd of mendicants, and so, too, does his wit, for he is ever ready with a reply to any piece of chaff which may be thrown at him by passers-by. This is a man whom we now learn to have been a lodger of the opium den, and to have been the last man to see the gentleman of whom we are in quest. But a cripple, I said. What could he have done as a single-handed man against the prime of his life? He is a cripple in the sense that he walks with a limp, but in other aspects he appears to be a powerful and well-nurtured man. Surely your medical experience would tell you, Watson, that the weakness of one limb is often compensated for by exceptional strength in the others. Pray, continue your narrative. Mrs. St. Clair had fainted at the sight of the blood upon the window, and she was escorted home in a cab by the police, as her presence could be of no help to them in their investigation. Inspector Barton, who had charge of the case, made a very careful examination of the premises, but without finding anything which drew any mat light into the matter. One mistake had not been made in not arresting Boone instantly, as he was allowed some few minutes during which he might have communicated with his friend the Lasker, but this fault was soon remedied, and he was seized and searched, without anything being found which could incriminate him. There were, it is true, some bloodstains upon his right sleeve shirt, but he pointed to his ring finger, which had been cut near the nail, and explained that bleeding had come from there, adding that he had been to the window not long before, and the stains which were observed there caused doubtless the same source. He denied strenuously having ever seen Mr. Neville St. Clair, and swore that the presence of the clothes in his room was as much a mystery to him as it was to the police. 
As for Mrs. St. Clair's assertion that she had initially seen her husband at the window, he declared that she must have either been mad or dreaming. He was removed, loudly protesting, to the police station, while the inspector remained upon the premises in the hope of ebbing tide might afford some fresh clue. And it did, though the hardly found upon the mud bank which they had feared to find, it was Neville St. Clair's coat, not Neville St. Clair, which lay uncovered by the tide receded. But what do you think they found in the pockets? I cannot imagine. No, I didn't think you might guess. Every pocket stuffed with pennies and half pennies. 421 pennies and 270 half pennies. It was no wonder that it had not been swept away by the tide, but a human body in a different matter. There is a fierce eddy between the wharf and the house. It seems likely enough that the weighted coat had remained when the body stripped of the, when stripped of the body had been sucked away into the river. Uh, but I understand that all the other clothes were found in the room. Would the body be dressed in the coat alone? No, sir. But the facts might be suspicious enough. Suppose that this man Boone had thrust Neville St. Clair through the window. There is no human eye which could have seen it. What would he do then? It would, of course, be instantly strike him that he must get rid of the telltale garments. He would seize the coat, then, and in the act of throwing it out, then it would occur to him that he could not swim or sink. He has little time, for he has heard the scuffle downstairs, and the wife has forced her way up. And perhaps he was already heard that the Lasker confederates of the police that hurried up the street. There is not an instant to be lost. He rushes to some secret board where he has accumulated the fruits of his beggary. He stuffs all the coins upon which he can lay his hands on the pockets to make sure that the coat's sinking. He throws it out, and would have done the same with the other garments had he not heard the rush of steps. Only just time to close the window when the police had arrived. Well, it certainly sounds feasible. Well, we will take it to the working hypothesis to warrant of a better. Boone, as I have told you, was arrested for t and taken into the situation. But it could not be shown that there had ever been before anything against him. He had for years been known as a professional beggar, but his life appeared to have been one that was very quiet and innocent. There are the matter stands at present, and the questions which have to be solved. What Neville St. Clair was doing in the opium den, what happened to him when he was there, where he is now, and what Hugh Boone had done to his, his disappearance, as all are within the solution of ever. I confess that I cannot recall any case within my experience which looked at first glance so simple, and yet which presented such difficulties. While well, Holmes has been detailing a singular series of events, we have been whirling through the outskirts of the great town until the last straggling houses have been left behind, and we rattled along the country hedge upon the other side of us. Just as we finished, just as he finished, however, we drove through two scattered villages where a few lights still glimmered in the windows. <clears throat> we are on the outskirts of Lee, said my companion. We have touched on three English countries in our short drive, starting in Middlesex, passing over an eagle, passing over an eagle of Surrey, and ending in Kent. See that light among the trees. That is the cedars. And the bedside lamp sits a woman whose anxious ears have already, I have little doubt, caught the clink of our horse's feet. But why are you not conducting the case from Baker Street? I asked. Because there are many inquiries which must be made out here. Mrs. St. Clair has most kindly put two rooms at my disposal, and you may rest assured that she will have nothing but a welcome for my friend and colleague. I hate to meet her, Watson when I have no news of her husband. Here we are. Whoa, whoa there. We pulled up in front of a large villa which stood within its own grounds. The stable boy had run out to the horse's head, 
and springing down to the followed Holmes up to the small, winding gravel drive which led to the house. As we approached, the door flew open, and a little blonde woman stood in the opening, clad in some sort of light mausoleum disorder, with a touch of fluffy pink chiffon around the neck and wrists. She stood with her figure outlined against a flood of light, one hand upon the door, the other half raised in her eagerness. Her body slightly bent, her head and face protruded, with eager eyes and parted lips. A standing question. Well, she cried, well. And then, seeing that there were two of us, she gave a cry of hope, which sank into a groan as she saw that my companion shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. No good news? None. No bad? No. Thank God for that. But come in, you must be weary. You've had a long day. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. He has been my most vital use of me in several cases, and a lucky chance has made it possible for me to bring him out and associate him with this investigation. I'm delighted to see you, she said, pressing my hand warmly. You will, I'm sure, forgive anything that may be wanting in our arrangements, when you consider the blow which has come so suddenly upon us. My dear madam, I said, I'm an old companion, and if I were not, I can very well see you. No apologies needed. If I can be of any assistance, whether to you or to my friend here, I shall indeed be happy. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said the lady as we entered a well-lit dining room, upon the table which this cold supper had been laid out. I should very much like to ask you one or two questions. To which I beg that you'll give a plain answer. Certainly, madam. Do not trouble my feelings. I'm not hysterical nor given to fainting. I simply wish to hear your real, real opinion. Upon what point? In your heart of hearts, do you think the devil was alive? Sherlock Holmes seemed to be embarrassed by the question. Frankly now. Frankly now, she repeated. She repeated, standing upon the rug and looking keenly down on him as he leaned back on the basket chair. Frankly, madam, I do not. Do you think that he is dead? I do. Murdered? I don't say that, perhaps. And on what day did he meet his death? On Monday. Hey, Silver Sayo. Welcome in. <clears throat> well, perhaps, Mr. Holmes, you will do good enough to explain this, how it is that I received a letter from him today. Sherlock Holmes sprang from his chair as if he had been galvanized. What? he roared. Yes, today. She stood smiling, holding up a little piece of paper in the air. May I see? Certainly. He snatched it from her eager in his eagerness and smoothing out smoothing it out on the table, drove the lamp and examined it intently. I had left my chair and was gazing at it over his shoulder. The envelope was a very coarse one, and was stamped with a Graveson postmark, and with a date of that very day, or rather, of the day before, for it was considerably after midnight. Coarse writing, murmured Holmes. Surely this is not your husband's writing, ma'am. No, but the enclosure is. I perceive also that whoever addressed this envelope had to go and acquire it as to the address. How can you tell that? The name, you see, is in perfectly black ink, which has dried itself. The rest of it is in a grayish color, which is shows the blotting paper has been used. If it had been written straight off, and then blotted, none of it would be a deep black shade. This man has written the name, and then has been, pause, 
before he wrote the address, which can only mean that he is not familiar with it. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as a trifle. Let us now see the letter. Ha! There has been an enclosure here. Yes, there was a ring, the signet ring. And you are sure that it is your husband's hand? One of his hands. One? His hand when he wrote hurriedly. It is very unlike his usual writing, and yet I know it well. Dearest, do not be frightened. All will come well. There is a huge error which is made by some little time of re rectify. Wait in patience, Neville. Written in pencil upon the fly leaf of a book, octavo size, no watermark. Hmm. Post the today engraved stand by a man with dirty thumb. Ha! And the flap has been gummed. If I am not very much in error, by a person who has been chewing tobacco. And you have no doubt that it's your husband's hand, ma'am? Now I never heard those words. And there were posted today in Gravesend. Where Miss Sinclair, the clouds have lightened. Though I should not venture to say that the danger is over. But he must be alive, Mr. Holmes. Unless he's... This is a very clever forgery to be put upon the wrong scent. The ring, after all, proves nothing. It may have been taken from him. No, no. It, it is. It is his very own writing. Very well. It may be, however, have been written on Monday and only posted today. That is possible. If so, much may have happened between. Oh, do not discourage me, Mr. Holmes. I know that is all well with him. There is so keenly a sympathy between us that I should know if evil came upon him. On the very day I saw him at last, he cut himself on the bedroom. And yet, I was in the dining room and rushed upstairs instantly with the utmost certainty that something had happened. Do you think that I would respond to such a trifle and be yet ignorant of his death? I have seen too much to know that the impression of a woman may be, of, well, may be more valuable than a conclusion of an, an analytical reasoner. And in this letter, you certainly have a very strong piece of evidence to corroborate your view. But if your husband is alive and able to write letters, why should he remain away from you? I cannot imagine. It's unthinkable. And on Monday, he made no remarks before leaving you? No. And you were surprised to see him in Sander Lane? Very much so. Was the window open? Yes. Then he might have called to you. He might. He only, as I understand, gave an inarticulate cry. Yes. A call for help, you thought. Yes, he waved his hands. But it might have been a cry of surprise, astonishment at an unexpected sight. You might w cause him to throw his up, throw up his hands. It is possible. And you thought he was pulled back. He disappeared so suddenly. He might have leaped back. Did you not see anyone else in the room? No, but this horrible man confessed to having been there, and the last girl was at the foot of the stairs. Quite so. Your husband, as far as you can see, had his ordinary clothes on. But without his collar or tie, I distinctly saw his bare throat. Had he ever been to Swandam Lane? No. Had he ever shown any signs of having taken opium? Never. Thank you, Mrs. St. Clair. Those are the principal points which I was wished to make absolutely clear. We shall now have a little supper and then retire, for we may have a very busy day tomorrow. A large and comfortable double bedroom had been placed at our disposal. I was quickly between the sheets for I was very weary after my night of adventure. Sherlock Holmes was a man, however, who, when he had an unsolved problem upon his mind, would go for days or even a week without rest, turning it over, rearranging his facts, looking at it from every point of view until he had fathomed it rather 
or convinced himself that his data was insufficient. It was soon evident to me that he was now preparing for an all-night sitting. He took off his coat and waistcoat and put on a large blue dressing gown, and was wandering about the room collecting pillows from his bed and the cushions of the sofa and armchairs. With these he constructed a sort of eastern chavern upon which he perched himself cross-legged, with an ounce of sta shag tobacco and a box of matches laid in front of him. In the dim light of the lamp I saw him sitting there, an old briar pipe between his lips, his eyes fixed vacantly upon the corner of the ceiling. The blue smoke curling up from him, silence, motionless, with the light shining upon his strong set aquiline features. So he sat as I dropped to sleep. So he sat when a sudden ejaculation caused me to wake up, and I found the summer sun shining in the apartment. The pipe was still between his lips, the smoke still curled upward, and the room was full of the dense tobacco haze, but nothing remained as a heap of shag which I had seen upon the previous night. Awake, Watson? he asked. Yes? Game for a morning drive? Certainly. Then dress. No one is stirring yet, but I know where the stable boy sleeps, and we shall soon have a trap out. He chuckled to himself as he spoke, his eyes twinkled, and he seemed a different man to the somber thinker of the previous night. As I dressed, I glanced at my watch. It was no wonder that no one was stirring. It was twenty-five minutes past the four. I had hardly wished, finished when Holmes returned with the news that the boy was putting on the horse. I want to test a little theory of mine, he said, pulling on the boots. I think, Watson, that you are now standing in the presence of one of the most absolute fools of, the, of Europe. I deserve to be kicked from here to Chang Cross, but I think I have a key to the affair now. And where is it? I asked, smiling. In the bathroom, he answered. Oh, yes, I'm not joking. He continued looking, <laughs> looking incredulity. I've just been there, and I have taken it out, and I have got it in this Gladstone bag. Come on, my boy, and we shall see whether it will fit into luck. We made our way downstairs as quietly as possible, and out of the bright morning sunshine. On the road stood our horse and trap, with the half-clad stable boy waiting at the hand. We both sprang in, and away we dashed to the London Road. A few country carts were stirring, bearing the vegetables to the metropolis, but the lines of villas on either side were silent and as lifeless as some city in the dream. It has been some points of a singular case, said Watson, said Holmes, flicking the horse into a gallop. I confess that I have been as blind as a bull, but it is better to learn wisdom late than to never learn it at all. And the town earliest risers were just beginning to look sleepily from their windows as we drove the streets of Surrey's side. Passing down the Waterloo Bridge Road, we crossed over the river, and dashing up Wellington Street, we wheeled sharply to the right and found ourselves at Bow Street. Sherlock Holmes was well known by the force, and the two constables at the door saluted him. One of them held the horse's lead, while the other led us in. Who's on duty? asked Holmes. Inspector Bradstreet, sir. Ah, Bradstreet, how are you? Tall, stout official had come down the flag stone flagged passage with a peat cap and fog jacket. I wish to have a quiet word with you, Bradstreet. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Step into my room here. It was a small office-like room with a huge ledger upon the table and a telephone projecting from the wall. The inspector sat down at his desk. What can I do for you, Holmes? I called about him. I called about that beggar man, Boone, the one who was charged with being concerned at the disappearance of Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee. Yes, he was brought up and remanded from further inquiries. So I heard. You have him here. And the cells. Is he quiet? Oh, he gives no trouble. But he is a dirty scoundrel. Dirty? Yes, it is all we can do to make him wash his hands and his face with the black of the ink black as the tinkers. Well, once his case has been sold, he will be a regular prison bath. 
And I think if you saw him, you would agree with me that he needed it. I should like to see him very much. Would you? That's easily done. Come this way. You can leave your bag. No, I think that I'll take it. Very good. Oh, come this way, then, if you please. He led us down a passage and opened a barred door, passed down a winding stair, and brought us through a whitewashed corridor with a line of doors on each side. The third on the right is his, said the inspector. Here it is. He quietly shot back a panel of the upper part of the door and glanced through. He's asleep, he said. You can see him very well. We both put our eyes to the grating. The prisoner lay with his face towards us in a very deep sleep, breathing slowly and heavily. He was a middle-sized man, coarsely clad as becoming his calling, with a colored shirt protruding through the rents of his tattered coat. It was, as the inspector said, extremely dirty. But the grime which covered his face could not conceal his repulsive ugliness. A broad wheel from an old scar ran across his, from ran across it, from his eye to his chin. And by the contradiction, had turned up on one side of the upper lip, so that three teeth were exposed in a perpetual snarl. A shock of red hair grew over, low over the eyes and the forehead. He is a beauty, isn't he? said the inspector. He certainly needs a wash, Mark Holmes. I had an idea that he might, and I took the liberty of bringing my tools with me. He opened the Gladstone bag as he spoke, and took out, to my astonishment, a very large bath sponge. <laughs> You're a funny one, chuckled the inspector. Now, if you will have the quite goodness to open that door very quietly, we will soon figure, make a cut of a much more respectable figure. Uh, I don't know why not, said the inspector. It doesn't look like a credit of Bow Street cells, does he? It slipped his key into the lock, and we were all very quietly entered the cell. The sleeper half turned and settled down once more into a deep slumber. Holmes stooped to the water jug, moistened his sponge, and then rubbed it twice vigorously across and down the prisoner's face. Let me introduce you, he shouted, to Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee, in the county of Kent. Never in my life had I seen such a sight. The man's face peeled off under the sponge like the bark from a tree. Gone was the coarse brown tint. Gone, too, was a horrid scar which had seemed to cross, and the twisted lip which had given the repulsive snare to the face. A twitch brought away by a tangled red hair, and there, still sitting up in his bed, was a pale, sad-faced, refined-looking man, black-haired and smooth-skinned, rubbing his eyes and staring about him in the sleepy bewilderment. Then, suddenly realizing his exposure, he broke into a scream and threw himself down on his face of his pillow. Good heavens, cried the inspector. It is indeed the missing man. I know him from the photograph. The prisoner turned with the reckless air of a man who abandons himself to his destiny. Be it so, he said, and pray, what am I charged with? With making your way with Mr. Neville St. Oh, come. You can't be charged with that unless they make you attempt the suicide of it, said the inspector with a grin. Well, I have been 27 years in the force, and this really takes the cake. If I am Mr. Neville St. Clair, then it is obvious that no crime has been committed, and that, therefore, I am illegally detained. No crime, but a very great error has been committed, said Holmes. You would have done better to have trusted your wife. It was not the wife, it was the children, cried the prisoner. God help me, I would not have them ashamed of their father. My God, what an exposure. And I can, what can I do? Sherlock Holmes sat down beside him on the couch and patted him kindly on the shoulder. 
<clears throat> if you leave us through a court of law, it's clear up the matter, he said. Of course, you can hardly avoid publicity. On the other hand, if you convince the police authorities that there is no possible case against you, I do not know that there is any reason that the details should find their way to the papers. Inspector Broadstreet would, I am sure, make notes of anything that you might tell him and submit to the proper authorities. The case then would never go into court at all. <clears throat> God bless you, cried the prisoner passionately. I could have endured imprisonment, I even execution rather than have left my miserable secrets as a family bought to my children. <clears throat> you are the first who have heard in my story. My father was schoolmaster in Chesterfield, where I was received in an excellent condition. I traveled on my youth, took to the stage, and finally became a reporter in the evening paper of London. One day, my editor wished a series of articles on begging in the metropolis, and I volunteered to supply them. There was the point from which all my adventures started. I was only trying begging as an amateur, and I could get the facts upon which I had to base my articles. When an actor, I had, of course, learned all the secrets of making up, and had been famous in the green room for my skill. I took advantage of my attainments. I painted my face to make myself look as pitiable as possible, and made a good scar, and fixed my side with a lip with twists of the aid of a small slip of flesh-colored plaster. Then, with the red, hand of, the red head of hair and an appropriate dress, I took my station in the business part of the city, ostensibly as a match-seller, but really as a beggar. For seven hours I plied my trade, and when I returned home in the evening, I found to my surprise I had received no less than twenty-six silver and five dough. I wrote my articles, and though little more than that then, sometime later I backed the bill for a friend, and had a writ served upon me for twenty-five pounds. I was at wit's end when it came to money, but a sudden idea came to me. I begged a fortnight's grace from the creditor, and asked for a holiday from my employers, and spent the time in begging the city under my disguise. Ten days I had the money and paid my debt. Well, you can imagine how hard it was to settle down arduous work of a two pound a week when I knew I could earn as much pay in a day by smearing my face with a little paint, laying my cap on the ground and sitting still. It was a long fight between my pride and the money, but the dollars won at last. I threw up my reporting and sat down day after day in the corner which I had first chosen, and sparing pity in my ghastly face and filling my pockets with coppers. Only one man knew my secret. He was a keeper of the low den which I had used to lodge in Swin Swindon Lane, where I could every morning emerge from the squalid beggar and the evenings transform myself into a well-dressed man about town. This fellow, Alaskar, was well paid by me for his rooms, so that I knew him would keep my secret was safe in his possession. <clears throat> well, as soon as I found out I was saving considerable sums of money, I did not mean that any beggar in the streets of London could earn £700 a year, which is less than my average takings. But I had exceptional advantages in my power of making up, and also the facility of repartee, which improved my practice and made me a quite recognizable character in the city. All day a stream of pennies, varied by silver, poured in upon me, and a very bad day in which I failed to make two pounds. As I grew richer I grew more ambitious. I took a house in the country, eventually married, without anyone having any suspicions of my real occupation. My dear wife knew that I had a business in the city. She little knew what. Last Monday, I'd finished for the day and was dressing my room above the op opium den when I looked out of the window and saw, to my horror and astonishment, that my wife was standing in the street, with her eyes fixed full upon me. I gave a cry of surprise, threw up my arms to cover my face, and, rushing my confidant, the last girl entreated him to prevent anyone from coming up to me. I heard her voice downstairs, but I knew that she could not ascend. Swiftly, I threw off my clothes, pulled on those of the beggar, and put my pigments in wigs. Even my wife's eyes could not pierce to compensate this, uh, complete the disguise. 
But then it occurred to me that there might be a search of the room, and that the clothes might betray me. I threw open the window, reopening it with violence of small cuts, which I had inflicted upon myself in the bedroom that morning. Then I seized my coat, which had weighed down my coppers, which I had just transferred from it from the leather bag which I had carried my takings. I hurled it out the window and disappeared into the Thames. The other clothes would have been followed, but at that moment there was a rush of constables and stare, and a few minutes later I found, rather I confess, to my relief, instead of being identified by Miss Neville at St. Clair, I was arrested as his murderer. <sighs> I do not know if there is anything else for me to do explain. I was determined to preserve my disguise as long as possible, and hence my preference for a dirty face. Knowing that my wife would be terribly anxious, I slipped off my ring and confided it to the Lasker at the moment when no constable was watching me, together with a hurried scrawl, telling her that she was in no cause to fear. That note only reached us today, said Holmes. Good God, what a week she must have spent. The police have watched the Alaska, said Inspector Bradstreet. And I can quite understand that he might have find it difficult to post a letter unobserved. Probably handed it to some sailor customer of hers who forgot all about it for some days. That was it, said Holmes, nodding approvingly. I have no doubt of it, but have you never been prosecuted for begging? Many times, <laughs> but what is a fine to me? It must stop there, however, said Broadstreet. If the police are so to hush things up, there must be no more high boon. I have sworn it is my most so most which man can take. In that case, I think it must be probable that no further steps be taken. But if you are found again, after all of it must come out, I'm sure, Mr. Holmes, that we are very much indebted to you for clearing up the matter, which I wish I knew had reached you results. I reached this one, said my friend, by sitting upon five pillows and consuming an ounce of shag. I think, Watson, if you have, if we had better drive to Baker Street, we shall be just in time for breakfast. Oof. Yeah. <clears throat> I must be getting tired. I was stammering way too much through that one. Ugh. <sighs> uh, I got two stories done tonight. I guess that's not bad. Let's, let's see who we can raid on after this one. Let's see. Unless anyone has any suggestions, I guess. Because I'm always open for suggestions. Even if I didn't make it a redeem, I'm always open for suggestions. <clears throat> I don't see any of the other readers on right now. Let's see. Oh, Reeve rated me recently. I guess I could rate him. Yeah, that's right, Reeve. So I have two different raid messages, one for subscribers, one for followers. <clears throat> I 
<clears throat> you can feel free to use either one of those if you have it. Uh, the read unlock is relatively cheap as far as using points to get it. I think I said it at maybe 50 points. Uh, it's not 50, where is it? Uh, 200 points, that's not bad. I mean, you can follow me and get that money, or where's that one, but... Uh, let me get him open real quick to make sure... Where'd he go? Okay, actually, no. Pop a penguin instead. Not rest him for a while. Tops if I can spell. Oh yeah, we'd pop the penguin. Again, thank you for the raid tonight. And I hope you enjoyed the stories. And I will see everyone. Um back to fairy tales tomorrow, so fairy tales are always good. But have a good night, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whichever one you may be in. And I will see you over in Pop Penguins. I don't know.